It is my great honor and privilege to welcome you to the Boston Foundation, and most especially to the Edgerly Center for Civic Leadership. Uh, you have been a friend and trusted colleague as we have been on our own philanthropic journey. And I want to recognize the outsized impact and enormous commitment that you have had on behalf of the nonprofit sector. My husband, Amos, who also joins me this evening, and I've had the benefit of your wisdom and counsel, as so many of us have in this field, in our efforts to grow, to learn, and to get better. Phil reminds us that leading nonprofit organizations are incredibly complex jobs and the caliber of leadership, commitment, and creativity that they exhibit day after day and year after year is truly remarkable and inspirational. And it is a reminder that our job is to figure out how to support them, to be as effective as they can be, and through them and their organizations, improve lives to make the world better. Before we dive into the book, we want to talk about what's going on in philanthropy writ large. And for any of you who've been following the field of philanthropy, you'll know that in the last year, we've had three different books that have come out that are probably three of the most critical books about philanthropy that I've observed, and Phil and I have had this conversation that either of us have observed in a couple of decades. You have Robert Reich, who's a professor at Stanford, writing Just Giving, really questioning how democracy fits into philanthropy. You have Anand Giriharadas writing Winners Take All, where he really fundamentally questions whether giving kind of whitewashes where the resources actually come from. Um, and you have our own Edgar Villanueva, who's local from the Schott Foundation, writing Decolonizing Wealth and really fundamentally asking some questions about the roots of the wealth and how those roots accrue to the populations that help to create that wealth. So in that context, Phil, what do you take away from those critiques? Um, what really resonates and what do you think that says about where the field is today? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's interesting because 10, 15 years ago, there was precious little critique. Uh, and it felt uh, frustrating, actually, to see how um, donors were heralded for work they hadn't even done yet, right? Uh, and um, I think you know, critique is healthy and important, and it's the only way we get better. It's a big part, obviously, what CEP does and, and what, what Barbara described uh, in her um, really wonderful uh, introductory comments. Um, I think my concern is that we have to be able to simultaneously um, surface the problems, and I think the three books in their own ways uh, surface important problems uh, in order to be able to address them, and we can come back to what some of those problems are. But I also think we need to be able to recognize progress in order to realize that progress is possible and draw the insights from that progress to apply to the challenges we face. I think that there's a tremendous uh, power dynamic in philanthropy and a concentration of power that is um, magnified in importance when we're talking about things like influencing policy. And so I think it is incumbent upon foundations to ensure that the right voices are shaping uh, perspectives about goals and strategies. And so um, this is an easy one, and hopefully it's not a cheap shot, but I tell the story in the book of um, Bill Gates and chickens. And uh, you know he writes this blog post about how the best way out of poverty for poor people is to raise chickens. And um, you just wonder about you know, who in the communications department sort of missed that one, right? Uh, and he said, if I were poor, this line in particular, if I were poor, that's what I would do. I would raise chickens, right? And so, and I have a lot of praise for the Gates Foundation too, but it, this is a great example of just completely missing the fact that it doesn't even matter if you're right that that's the best way out of poverty for poor people in developing countries. If they don't think you're right, or if the people between you and the people you're trying to influence don't think you're right. So, of course, you know, my favorite uh, headline was when Bolivia uh, said, no, thank you, we don't want your chickens, and The Guardian <laughs> said, cluck you, Bill Gates. <laughs> it's one thing to talk about uh, having outsized influence on policy, but 
What about philanthropy's role in helping actually people secure you know, basic rights that allow them to be full uh, democratic citizens? I, I think Rob sort of uh, underplays that. And, and so I think, I think it is wrong to say that philanthropy is failing democracy. I think the strong civil society that we have in this country is a vital part of our democracy and distinguishes it from countries like China that don't have that strong uh, civil society. And then Anand's book, I think, is, is they're all worth reading. I think his critique is right on for calling out the ridiculous sort of what I, and I've probably used this line too many times, but refer to as a floor cleaner and a dessert topping perspective on capitalism, that you can simultaneously solve every significant social problem and get wildly wealthy, that going to McKinsey is like joining the Peace Corps, you know? Uh, <laughs> and this is just total BS. He does a great job of calling it out. And then he jumps the shark, if you can, if you can use that term anymore, and paints with a ridiculously broad brush and never acknowledges, and this is a problem I think in both uh, this is really dangerous to do because they're going to get up and slam my book. But uh, in both Rob and Anand's book, utterly missing are these important players, nonprofits, and their leaders and staff who are funded by philanthropy for better or worse. That's the reality. And I think that's a big oversight. So Phil said to me, Jim, when we do this thing, the one thing I really don't want to do is I don't want to read from my book. And I said, okay, that sounds good. I said, but I still get to read from his book if that's okay. <laughs> he may not. Um, but I want to pick up on a theme that Phil raised, this issue about the connection or lack thereof between those of us in philanthropy and the ultimate beneficiaries of our work. And there's a part in the book where Phil speaks to this in part because the Center for Effective Philanthropy did some groundbreaking work by creating something called Youth Truth a number of years ago. And I could let Phil tell that story. But you have this quote in the book. Hearing from intended beneficiaries is something that nonprofits routinely seek to do, but it's more difficult for givers because they're not the ones doing the work on the ground. Yet it is absolutely crucial for givers to understand the perspectives of those you seek to help. Can you talk a little bit about this? Because this has been an important theme for you, and it's one that you talk about in the book. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, to, I think it is um, what Bill Gates clearly hadn't done when he wrote that uh, blog post. Um, and I think that it is what we have failed to do uh, sufficiently in our conversations about public education in the US, where we have seen failed um, after failure after failure uh, as often folks who made their money in technology um, where you know it was an innovation or a breakthrough or an app that got them where they are in terms of their wealth and their business success have looked for something analogous in education. Uh, but if w folks had done a better job, and this is where Youth Truth really came to be, hearing from students they would have understood that it's just not that simple, that, uh, that the Gates uh, path, which I don't mean to caricature, but more or less looks something like this. Break big small schools, big, big high schools into small schools. Oops, that didn't work. Let's focus on teachers and teacher evaluation and tying it to um, teacher compensation. Oh, that didn't work. Let's talk about Common Core. That's, that's the thing. That didn't work. Had, had there been more systematic deep listening to students, to teachers, to school administrators, to families, I think there would have been a recognition of the complexity and interdependency of a variety of different aspects of what gets in the way of outcomes, including poverty, uh, among other things. Um, and, and so I just think it's, um, you know, people talk a lot at foundations about getting buy-in. Um, and that's, that's not, you know, that drives me crazy because that assumes that you had the answer and now you're just sort of getting everybody to agree with you, right? What you really have to do, it, which is hard and you would know better than me how hard it is because you actually have to run a foundation, whereas I can just talk about how I think people should do that. <laughs> um, uh, 
<laughs> really engage folks. Uh, and it goes back to what I said before, because they are the best experts, you know, on, on their own on their own line. There's a perspective about strategy that is that is born out of a competitive dynamic frame uh, where our strategy has to be ours and nobody else's and it has to be a, a unique value proposition and all of this stuff that doesn't make sense in philanthropy. Um, it has to be shared and, and, and shared not just, and this often gets translated as, oh, funders collaborative, you know, mm -hmm. we'll share the strategy. Okay, that's good, you know, that's better than just doing it uh, your own self, but what about the grantees and what about, what about the folks, you know, who are on the ground or who are um, affected by the work that you're doing? Uh, really, the strategy's gotta be shared that broadly. Um, now, obviously, I don't wanna oversimplify, and, and I would also say that the context is everything. You know, there are times when you know what needs to be done. Uh, and so if we're going to pick, and, and, and then you really just want to get it done, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and when you do know that something works, then I think the frame is different. Uh, look, look, looking at Mark Edwards, I'm thinking about something like uh, Upstream, you know, which, which, which he leads, where, like, it's pretty clear that providing access to more effective contraception is, is gonna be beneficial. And so you, you, you really just want folks to get behind just doing that. And there isn't the same kind of like questioning of, well, might that not lead to that? We kind of know that it does. Um, and I, I would argue the same was true in, in some of Gates' global health work, and not to oversimplify, but people are dying of diseases they don't need to die of. We can immunize, vaccinate, and you can have this incredible achievement, much of which happened before the Gates Foundation was around, but they, they deserve a, a fair amount of credit for, for, for the more recent uh, part. And, and the reality is that the childhood mortality rate worldwide in 1960 was 18.5%, and in 2015, it was 4.5%. And this is huge, and this is enormous, and that's, that's a, there are times where you do have a more top-down mm -hmm. model, because you know this is what works. But I think those are more the exception than the rule um, in these complicated and interdependent contexts that we're working. Okay. So let me ask this, why did you write your book? What, what were you hoping that you were gonna contribute um, to this ongoing understanding of our field? Yeah, I mean, first of all, this would be an opportunity for me to say that, that people said very nice things at the outset that were very much about me. Uh, however, I view the book as a compilation of a lot of knowledge and expertise of a lot of different people. Um, maybe most importantly, the staff of, of CEP, uh, many of whom are here, but also board members, individual nonprofit leaders who like Greg Cruteau, who is here, who just allowed me to just hang out with him and watch what he does uh, in, in, uh, at, at UTech um, and, and the amazing work that they do. You know, it, it, so, so to a certain extent, I wanted to just package up a lot of those insights mm -hmm. because I felt inspired by what can happen when giving is done right. Uh, and, uh, and I actually think it's really underappreciated, right? Like the degree to which we don't worry that our kid's gonna die of yellow fever or we take for granted, you know, the you know, traffic safety or um, we think of people in our family who we love and know that, and this is a relatively recent development, that they get to marry who they love. Uh, and you know, these are things that, that I don't think we celebrate enough and learn from. And so I wanted, I wanted to sort of provide some of that inspiration. Um, and then I also had um, a lot of conflicting emotions of frustration with the inevitable making of the entirely predictable errors uh, by especially great big new uh, foundations and their really, really wealthy donors. So, so when you, you know, have the job that I have and you have to be on the other side of conversation sometimes where people are saying, uh, what we're doing here is unprecedented. You know, it's never been done. We are focused on root causes, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, I could show you an article from Outlook magazine in 1906. <laughs> That's basically about how the new donors are focused on root causes, although they don't use that, the, the author uh, doesn't use that phrase. And it's just like, 
do I have to watch this train wreck? You know, um, is there anything? Is there anything we can do to prevent it? And I'm realistic. Is my book going to prevent it? You know, I, a man can dream. You know, <laughs> and, and and then the other part about it, I think, and, and the last part is is there are certain things, you know, and we've talked about this over the years. There are certain things that just haven't changed, that. I desperately want to change, and, and not to just be too predictable, but the biggest one is, you know, the kind, the lack of flexible and long-term predictable support that funders provide to nonprofits. So we have surveyed like roughly a gazillion uh, <laughs> nonprofit grantees of um, foundations, and this emerges as an issue, you know, no matter how you slice it, qualitatively, quantitatively, this matters to nonprofits. And yet, aggregate data, no change. We see funders that regularly use the grantee perception report actually do change their practice, which I think is just a function of if you continually hear like the same criticism over and over, it's kind of like in your family, you know, it's like, oh gee, I, I really do talk too much sometimes, you know, like I've got to work on that. Or, or, um, you know, I really have to stop just like leaving my stuff on the living room floor like it's really annoying everybody else. Um, eventually you will change. Um, maybe. And, and, uh, and so, but, but on the aggregate data we haven't seen field wide change. And I thought maybe what we're lacking here is just the human story of what does it mean um, when uh, for example, not to pick on him, but you know, when, when, or highlight him again, but when Greg, who is doing this work at UTech, which is literally about life and death, right? Trying to get folks um, out of gang affiliations, into jobs, get them productive, and has incredible um, data on uh, you know, recidivism of 10% compared to a state average of, of 50%. Um, these staff who work at UTech, the street workers, you know, what, what are they doing? Uh, they're showing up at emergency rooms. They're showing up at funerals. They're visiting jails and prisons because these are the places where you can best recruit people to say, hey, maybe, maybe, maybe your life should be different and, and we're there for you. And then to have to worry about whether you can really pay them a competitive wage or whether you know, that single year grant is gonna, is gonna be re-upped. And it's the same worry that he's got as a woman named Julie Phelps, who I spent time with at a local $1.2 million you know, budget arts organization called Counterpulse in the Bay Area that I mm -hmm. just wrote about in the, in the Chronicle. Exact same, totally different organization, doing different things, exact same issue. You know? uh, maybe, if we, if we put a human face on these stories and put them in context a little bit more, maybe that will help create more change. So those are a few of the reasons. The absurd waste of opportunity that is the board meeting that is so scripted and sort of pre-arranged that, you know, if, if, if Mary gets up to get a cup of coffee, you know, the chair and the CEO are like, that wasn't supposed to happen. You know, uh, everything has been pre-decided. And, and there's no point in the board meeting, right? Uh, and things are so controlled. And, and so I think there's this huge opportunity to improve governance and then who is on these boards. And the shocking lack of diversity on big foundation boards in almost every respect. Um, uh, the obvious ones and the less obvious ones. Yeah, and I would just add, I think, I thought one of the places you were going to go, because we've talked about this as well, is the enormous wasted cost as well of when there's leadership change at a foundation, oh, absolutely. of the inevitable 180 degree shifts that occur, right, right. which to me have always raised the question, where has that board been totally. for the last five or six years if they are so fundamentally dissatisfied with the strategy of the foundation that they're willing to let a new leader come in and shift the entirety of that institution's totally. work? Um, it's just such, it's so mystifying to me. Yeah. But then there is a level of hype about where, where we lose all perspective about the fact that many of the problems that philanthropy and nonprofits are working to address are the ones that have defied market solutions 
or government intervention. That is why they exist still as problems, right? And, and so I have been to many a presentation where, you know, I mean, one that sticks in my mind that was particularly galling, where, you know, you see the, the chart of, of the increase in the number of, like, B Corps and, you know, hybrid social enterprises. And it's like this, you know, and then you realize, you do the math, and you realize the total number still rounds to zero as a percentage of nonprofits, right, relative to, and it's because they're, they're you know, we should look for those opportunities where you can do good and, 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 and make a profit, although, you know, the market should be pretty good at finding those, and we need to really recognize that, that there's a lot that doesn't, that doesn't fit. Uh, and, and I worry that, like exactly what you said, that the oxygen has been sucked away uh, and that all of our conversations about, about this work are now about social enterprise and they're all happening at business schools with a particular frame and that we've not done a good job of telling the story of these organizations that are um, mission first and uh, not for profit. So, so I, you know, I do write about that in the book uh, and, and, and about the hype. And, and at the same time, of course, there are places where I think you know, impact investing can be powerful. But I think the hype has been, and, and even just the confusion about like, being clear that when you buy a Patagonia, you know, you, that's not, I mean, that's awesome. I love Patagonia. It's not the same as philanthropy.